This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's class. Uh, I would like to thank my dear host, Mr. Josh Morheim, for uh, introducing me and for hosting me this Shabbos. It's really a great inspiration to see so many people taking uh, time out of their busy schedule to dedicate time for Limit Torah. And uh, the Chida tells us that after 120, the most important question, the most poignant question that will be asked is, Kavata Itam La Torah, did we set aside time for learning Torah? And the Chida writes that often we're excused from uh, that indictment based on the fact that we're busy uh, making a living. However, says the Chida, what it will boil down to is in our free time, if we, are, if we dedicate our free time to learning, so then we could say, well, when we weren't free, we, uh, we, we didn't have an opportunity, and whenever we were, we took advantage of it. But uh, says the Chida, if a person doesn't take advantage of their free time, then they'll be held liable, not only for their free time, but for the entire day, because one no longer has the excuse that, well, I would have if I could have. Um, and uh, with that, let us begin. I just want to, uh, my host stepped out, so Miksa Shvachai Befana Vekulai Shaloi Befana. It's really a great inspiration for me to see a young man who wakes up at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning to dedicate time for learning uh, before the day starts. And um, it's, uh, it's Kinah Soifrim, something that I myself uh, am jealous of. And we bless everyone here with uh, continued success in all of your endeavors. Okay, we only have a brief amount of time this afternoon. What I would like to do is I would like to analyze an episode in the Chumash which often gets overlooked and is not treated with the proper analysis and, so to speak, make us in tune to some of the fine details over here and see that the story is more than meets the eye. This, of course, is the story of the four kings and the five kings. The, the basic storyline is there were um, four very powerful kings. Five of the kings were subjected to them. They served the five kings for 12 years. They rebelled for 13 years. And in the 14th year of the rebellion, the four kings, as we'll see, headed by a man by the name of Kedar Laimar, said, enough is enough. We're going to beat the living daylights out of the five kings. And uh, they did. And the, the four kings um, attacked the five kings. Many of them run away to the mountains. Other of them fell into a pit, including the king of Sodom. Well, the four kings then take captive, uh, in a very important captive by the name of Lot. Avraham hears about it. He hears that his nephew is captured. He goes to rescue his nephew, and he destroys the four kings. And the story ends happily ever after. And we don't really make too much of the story other than the fact that Lot is captured and Abraham rescues him. Gentlemen, what in the world is this episode doing in the Torah? What do we learn from it? Why is it here? Why interrupt the regularly scheduled broadcast of the life of Abraham Avinu to tell us the story of these kings? So what I would like to do is present to you some um, oddities of the wording and the text and this will give, make us sensitive to the fact that there's something beneath the storyline that we, we would like to try to uncover. Okay, the Pasuk says like this. W- what time do I have, Tell? Two, 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 two. Around two o'clock. Okay. Let's read the Pasukim. Vahibimei Amraphel. It was in the days of Amraphel, Melech Shinar, Aryoich Melech Elasar, Kedar Laarmer, Melech Elam, Vesidol Melech Goyim. Four kings. Batting leadoff. I don't know. In, in Britain, they have baseball. They, there's baseball here in, in England. No. no. In America, there's something called baseball. You know, batting first is a leadoff hitter. Is number second the three hole. Now a cleanup hitter. No, you're not not familiar with that. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Do, there's an, there's a guy. His name is Amraphel. He's the first king. There's Aryoich, there's Kedar Oimer, and there's Siddal. Comes Rashi, and Rashi identifies. Who's Amraphel? Rashi says in number two, Amraphel is Nimrod. Why is he called Amraphel? Says, the word, says Rashi, Amraphel is a compound word. Amar Poel. Sha'amar li Avraham, he tells Avraham, Poel letoich kivshan ha'ish. Jump into the furnace. So Rashi is identifying that who is Amraphel? He's good old Nimrod that we read about in Parshas Noyach. He was the king of Shinar. He's the king of Bavel. He's the mighty warrior, the great heretic, the one who denied the existence of God. By the way, I once heard um, 
in the name of Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, who says over in the name of the Vilna Gain, that there is some source that the symbol of Nimrod was a horizontal line intersected by a vertical line. The cross. And the meaning of the cross was the horizontal line, the vertical line is the connection between heaven and earth. And the horizontal line is the severing of that connection. In other words, we are not connected. We run our life the way we would like to. We don't feel subjugated to the heavens. We're severed from the Shamayim. Well, be it as it may, that's Nimrod. The, what do we know about Nimrod? He was a Gibar Tzayid. He was a mighty warrior before God. He was what Chazal say, Yodea Ribbono Yomachavein Limroid boy. He knew who God was and had intention to rebel against him. And it says Rashi, who is Amraphel? He's Nimrod. So the first question is, why is Rashi telling us that Amraphel is anyone different than Amraphel? If I come in here and say my name is Daniel Gladstein, then that's my name. Take it at face value. That's my name. Why would we need to interpret it? No, really, his name is Yaakov Friedman. I mean, he told you his name. That's his name. So here the Pasuk is saying, by he be me Amraphel, it was in the days of Amraphel, Rashi doesn't need to comment. His name is Amraphel. Why does Rashi need to say, no, he's not Amraphel, he's Nimrod. So the Sufse Chachamim explains, well, it's got to be Nimrod. Because if you look in Parshas Nayach, the king of Shinar is Nimrod. It says, V'chush Yolad es Nimrod, Hu heichel liyoz gibar ba'aretz, Hu hayo gibar tzai lefnei Hashem, V'atihi reishis ma'amach doi bavel, so we already know the king of Shinar is Nimrod. So if the Pasuk is saying, it's got to be that it's the same old Nimrod. So the question is, so just say it straight. Say, Nimrod. Why give a different name? Why the pseudonym? Why, will, why the name change? If he wasn't called Amraphel originally, why call him Amraphel now? Here's another major question. Throughout the whole episode of the Four Kings, there's a certain batting order, there's a certain listing. What are they? Look at number five. Ace Kedar Laimer, Melech Elam. So Kedar Laimer is number one. Visidol Melech Goyim is number two. Viam Rafael Melech Shinar, the Aryech Melech In other words, the order, the hierarchy of the Four Kings is number one is always Kedar Laimer. To the point where after this Pasuk, whenever we talk about the four kings, we only mention Kedar Laimer, there is no mention of any of the other kings. Look at number six. In the 14th year of the rebellion, Kedar Laimer and the kings with him. What do you mean the kings with him? Why can't we get their names? Why can't we say, together with Siddal Melech Goyim, together with Amraf? The answer is they're subsidiary, they're secondary, they're of second importance. The main guy here is Kedar Laimer. Well, then the question is, and Rashi even points out, look at number seven, Ba Kedar Laimer, Hu Hayar Baal Hamaseh, He's the main character. That's why he's coming to attack the five kings. In other words, Kedar Laimer is clearly the main player over here. So if Kedar Laimer is the main player, why does the storyline begin? Why does the story begin with Amraphel? I thought Kedar Laimer is the main guy. What happened? It begins by Hibi Mei Amraphel, but then Rashi says Kedar Laimer is the main player, and that's why he's always listed first, and that's why sometimes he's only listed. So then the story should begin, and it was in the days of Kedar Laimer. So you'll say it's in alphabetical order. And that's why I didn't say Nimrod, it says Nimrod, because then he wouldn't be first, basically. Well, good point. Now, uh, two things. One is, I am not familiar that there is a concept of alphabetical listing in the entire Torah. <laughs> there is no um, concept other than in, you know, bibliography. Nowhere else, let's say by the Benos Slavchad, we, um, Rashi, one place says it's listed, they're listed by age, one place in order of Chashivas. Nowhere does anything, hey, you know what's going on? It's alphabetical order. That's, that's not a concept that is found, although I've heard that offered a number of times lately. It's an interesting thought. If that's the case, though, why would the Torah not be consistent and continue with that alphabetical listing? Now, it's interesting, if you look in the Medrash, why is Rashi only darshaning, look at number one, Amraphel 
His name was Amrafa because Amar Paul. Why doesn't Rashi Darshan Aryoch or Kedar La Oimer or Siddo, the names of these people? The Medrash also expounds upon them. Why is Rashi only telling you about Amraphel? And the Lavush explains. The Lavush is one of the great Achronim. He wrote a commentary on Rashi. So a commentary on a commentary is called a super commentary. The Lavush points out that the reason why Rashi is darshaning the name Amraphel is because Rashi is bothered by a question. If Kedar Oimer is the main character over here, why in Pasuk Aleph is Amraphel listed first? And that sort of compels Rashi to identify Amraphel as somebody else and to expound upon his name. Okay, but let's proceed. These are some of the things that I want you to be attentive to. Take a look at number nine. So Avraham here is a word that Lot is captured, and he's going out to, uh, to rescue Lot. So they took Lot. This is one of the most peculiar psukim in Kal Kula. There's an oddity over here that we sort of overlook, but if we pay careful attention to it, there's obviously something, uh, there's a signal over here. So Vayikhu es Lot, they took Lot. Ve'esruchushai, and his possessions. Who is Lot? Ben Achi Avram. Lot is the son of the brother of Avram. Avram had a brother, Haran. Lot is the son of Haran. Vayelechu. So the, the, five, the four kings, they took Lot. They took Lot's possessions. Who is Lot? The son of the brother of Aram. V'hu Yoishev Bistaim. Dear friends, this Pasuk is grammatically incorrect. Why? Imagine I told you a story. There was once a guy named uh, Levi. Levi had a nice couch. And who was the couch? The couch was the son of Levi's brother. So let's get the story straight. Levi had a brother, you know, uh, Reuven Levi had a brother, Shimon Levi. Shimon Levi gave birth to a couch. And now this couch is the nephew of Reuven Levi. Well, what is the puzzle talking about? They took light, they took his possessions. Who is the son of the brother of Abraham? That is grammatically incorrect. There's a mistake over here. It should, the Pasuk should read, Vayikhu es loit ben achi Avram v'yes ruchushai. Right? I mean, it's an obvious error. What's going on in this Pasuk? I mean, we should take the Sefer Torah, bring it to a cipher, and say somewhere along the ages there, there must have been a mix-up. Why does the Pasuk say, Vayikhu es loit and his possessions, the son of the brother of Avram. It's out of order. It's, in America, we call it discombobulation. I don't know if that's a word, but that's, what he, that's how we would say it. Okay. The Arizal himself is perceptive to this, uh, this oddity. And the Arizal says there's a Kabbalistic secret that's being conveyed in this Pasuk. And that is, I'm just bringing out that this, this oddity has... Uh, Garner the attention of all the Torah giants. And Arizal says that when Avraham went to rescue Lot, he wasn't just rescuing Lot, but there was a holy soul that was, so to speak, trapped in Lot and in Lot's family. And by Avraham rescuing him, he was going to free this holy soul. You know whose soul was in Lot? So we would have said, of course, uh, David, King David, David Amelach, because Lot's daughter was the progenitor, was the mother of uh, Moab. But besides that, the soul of the redactor of one of the great Amoram of Shas, Rava. Rava's soul was trapped in Lot. And who says this? None other than the Arizal himself. Where is this alluded to? Says the Arizal, the Rashi Tevois, the first letters of the words, Rechushai ben Achi, spell out Rava. Rechushai ben Achi, spell out Rava. And when Abram rescued Lot, he was freeing Talmud Ravli. Says the Arizal, well, well, you know, you can't just, uh, uh, Rashi Tevos is not just a game. How do we really know that's what it means? Says the Arizal, because why did the Torah write, Rechusho ben Achi Avram? It should have wrote, Vayikhu es loit ben Achi Avram v'yes Rechushoi. The answer is, if it would have wrote it correctly, we would have not seen the remez, the allusion to Rava. The Torah purposely changed it around in order to allude to the holy soul of Rava that is uh, laden, that is hidden in light. Just bringing to your attention that this question was so powerful that it, it led the Arizal to this concept. But let's explain in a simple way. Rabbi Shimon Schwab, who is a Rav in New York in Kahaladas Yeshurun, points out something uh, very powerful over here. And that is, let's make an observation about Lot. Lot's really a good guy. Think about it. His father was Haran. Haran risked his life to be loyal to Abraham. 
When Nimrod was standing there in Orkazim, yeah, are we good? Are we on the air? If anybody misses any shir, you can always catch it on TorahAnytime.com. I want to welcome my dear friend, Rabbi Aaron Subar from Muncie, New York, who is at the video camera t- today. Thank you so much. Rabbi Shimon Schwab makes a very amazing observation, and that is, Lot is the son of Haran. Haran risked his life when Nimrod threw Avraham into the fire, Nim- and Avraham was saved. Nimrod then turns to Haran and says, Haran, whose team are you on? Are you on my team? Do you cut yourself off from the heavens? Or do you believe in God? Nimrod claimed he was God. And Haran said, look, Avraham, my uncle, is saved. I'm on Avraham's team. They threw Haran into the fire. What happened to him? He died. Because Rashi points out that Avraham was thrown into the fire altruistically. He didn't know he would be saved, and therefore he was saved. Haran thought he would be saved like Avraham, and therefore he was not. And Lot, at that moment, pledged his loyalty to Abraham. Lot followed Abraham from Orkazdim to Haran to Israel. When God told Abraham, Lech Lecha, go to, the, go to Israel, Lot accompanied him. And when Abraham went down to Egypt and he said, you see this beautiful woman, she's my sister, Lot zipped his mouth. Lot was a loyal follower of Abraham. To the point where when he goes to Sodom, he's doing Hachnasas Orchem the same way Avraham Avinu did Hachnasas Orchem. But yet, suddenly he became a Rasha. How do we know that? Because the moment that Lot separates from Avraham, the Pasuk says, Vayoymer Hashem al Avraham, Acharehi Pared Lot Meimo. God spoke to Avraham when, God, when, Abraham se- when Lot separated from him, says Rashi. So long as Lot was with Avraham, God did not speak to Abraham. Because when you associate with the wicked, God says, you go with the wicked, but I don't go with you. As long as a person is connected to bad people, Hashem is not close to them. By the way, the first step in the service of Hashem is keep away from bad neighbors. How do we know that? The book of Tehillim. It's a book of pra- a prayer, of praise, of shvach. How does Tehillim begin? You hear, what's Tehillim? It's a book of... David's longing for God. Tehillim begins, Step one in service of God is get yourself a good friend and stay away from bad people. Because you can have the best motivations and the greatest heart. If you're friendly with bad people, they will pull you down. I once heard that from a great tzaddik, Rabbi Victor Miller. So says Rashi, the moment that Lot separates from Avraham, God speaks to Avraham. So if you look over there, one of the commentaries of Rashi, actually there's something called a Haga on Rashi. There's a footnote on Rashi. And the footnote asks, but Lot wasn't a bad guy. Lot used to be a great guy. Didn't Rashi say earlier Lot was rewarded for zipping his mouth when he didn't reveal that Sarah was Abraham's sister? Says Rashi, yeah, he used to be good and he suddenly became bad. So what happened to him? What happened to Lot? There is no evidence given in the whole Chumash of where Lot had his downfall. Says Reb Shimon Schwab in his opinion, this Pasuk is the turning point in Lot's life. How's that? There was Avraham and there was Lot. And if you have a good Rebbe, a good teacher, he's going to bring you up as long as there's no separation between you and your Rabbi. But Lod allowed there to be a separation between him and Abraham. You know what the separation was? His money, his car, his home, his possessions, his couch, his rechush. Vayikhu es loit. They took loit. But here's the problem. Ve'es rechushoi ben achi Avram. And the possessions, he was the son of Avram, meaning he allowed his possessions to interfere. Whenever Avraham would teach a lesson, but Lot would think, but what am I going to do? Yeah, but I have to make more. But I have to buy. But how am I going to keep? His possessions always got in the way of his learning. That's why the Pasuk writes, Vayikhu es loit ve'es rechushoi ben achi Avram. Maybe I could interpret it similarly, but in, in also in a, in a vein similar to the way Rabbi Shimon Schwab interprets other psukim. We'll just do it briefly because the hour is late. And that is, there are two kinds of people. Some people, they're successful, they have possessions, they have a nice home, they have a nice car, they have money, but it doesn't define them. They are who they are, and they happen to have possessions. And there are other people 
who, when you think of them, their identity is defined by their money and their possessions. I'll give you an analogy. This is bad because it's an American analogy. You've heard of the New York Yankees, you know? It's a, it's a sports franchise in America. In, where I live, there are, there are many Yankee fans. It's a New York team. But there are some people that they have a Yankees logo on their front door. So, I have a question. Here you have a Jewish family. Why do they have a New York Yankees logo on their front door? Basically, they're declaring to the world. They don't just happen to follow the New York Yankees. They live and breathe the New York Yankees. When the Yankees win, they are happy. And when the Yankees lose, they are miserable. They have intertwined their identity with the New York Yankees. What has happened to Lloyd is he has not just become successful. His name has become. It's not Lloyd and he happened to become, happened to own Rechusha. His name is now Lloyd V.S. Rechusha. Lloyd and his car, Lloyd and his couch, Lloyd and his home. That's the problem with Lloyd. He has become so identified by his possessions that that's him. But I'll give you an analogy in the other extreme, Latayv. Some people... They're so connected to davening, they don't just daven, but they're identified by their tefillah. You know, who, you know a man like that? His name is David HaMelech. What does David HaMelech say in Tehillim? Vani tefillah, and I am prayer. Meaning, I am not just someone who happens to pray. I am prayer. David HaMelech says, Ani Shalom. I don't just pursue peace. I don't just run after peace. I have identified myself with the ideals of peace. Be it as it may, let's move on for a moment so we could wrap this up. So, we'll take a look at number 13. Vayavoy HaPolet, and the refugee came. And we know, of course, Rashi says the refugee is Ogmal Chavashan. Vayageh li Avram Ivri, and he tells Avram the Ivri, Vuhu shoichin be'elone mamre ha'amoyri, he's living in Eloine mamre. Ah, so listen to this. Vayishma Avram, and Avram heard, ki nishba achiv, that his brother was captured. One second, that's inaccurate. Lot is not the brother of Avram. Lot is the nephew of Avram. Why would the Pasuk describe Lot with an inaccurate relationship? By the way, friends, this is not the only time the Torah does that. Earlier in Lech Lecha, when Avraham and Lot were parting ways, so Avraham says to Lot, you know, let's not fight, let's not be bitter, let's not be contentious. After all, ki anoshim achim anachnu. We're bros. We're brothers. So Rashi's bothered. What do you mean we're brothers? Avraham was Lot's ne- uncle. So Rashi says, what Avraham meant was, we look alike. We look like we're brothers. We look identical. Rashi reveals to us that Avraham and Lot looked identical. Which means, but here's the problem. Why is Avraham invoking the fact, by the way, let's not fight. We look alike. And if we didn't look alike, then we could fight. What does the relevance of the fact that they look alike have to do with us not fighting? So the Mepharshim explain, the Nachlas Yaakov explains as follows. That what Avram was telling Lot, is, there's a big problem over here. Because your shepherds are grazing on the land of other people. What do we call that? Gazela. So you know what? I told you not to do it. So you're not listening. So it's not my problem anymore. So really, we could still live together happily. But here's the issue. I'm an honest man. I'm preaching morality and ethics. I'm telling people, stick to your own property. If they see you allowing your animals to graze in other people's fields, they're going to think it's me. We look identical. And therefore, I can no longer live with you peacefully. That's why Avraham is invoking the fact that we are brothers, we look alike, and therefore we cannot live together anymore. Okay, so here's the clincher. Two years ago, Parshas Lachacha had the opportunity to speak in uh, the States, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And the rabbi over there said over Dvar Torah, and he said he heard it from Rabbi Vadi Yosef. Now, I always like to check the sources. People say, oh, I heard it Dvar Torah. Who says it? Not sure. Not sure if I heard it from my kindergarten teacher, or if you know one of the... You've got to know who says it. You have to know the source. Is it a Rishon? Is it an Achron? It's very important to know the sources of Torah material. So he told me he heard it from Ravad Yosef, so I went to check it up. In fact, they published the oral lectures of Ravad Yosef, and I found he did say this. And here's the main question here. Lot is a bad guy now. 
Where does Lot move? Saddam. That means Lot has an opportunity to live with the greatest Torah scholar generation, Abraham, and he chooses to live in Saddam where they sodomize innocent guests. So Lot's a bad guy. Why is Abraham ris- risking his life to save his nephew? His nephew made a bad choice. Abraham Avinu said, I would love for you to stay with me. And Lot said, no, I'd rather go to uh, San Francisco. I'd rather go to, S- to Saddam. <laughs> and... Listen to this. Says of Avad Yosef, here's the issue. And this is what the whole story is about. There was a man by the name of Nimrod. Nimrod got into a confrontation with Abraham. Nimrod said, I'm God. Abraham said, you're not God. There's a God Almighty of heaven and earth. Nimrod said, really? And he throws Abraham into the fire, and Abraham is rescued. And the entire career of Nimrod is marred by the fact that in his personal confrontation with Abraham, Abraham triumphed. And Nimrod says, oh, wow. Nimrod was a tag-along with Kedar Omar. But you know what? Nimrod had a great idea. If I could capture Avraham's nephew, I could get some revenge against Avraham and save face. And you know what? I'll tell people that even though Avraham got, got away from me, but at least I got his nephew, that would show that I'm somewhat powerful. And then Nimrod had, in Yiddish we call it an Einfall. He had a, a stroke of a brilliance. Eureka moment. This guy Lot looks identical to Avraham Avinu. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tie him up and I'm going to parade him through the streets. I'm going to tell everyone, Avraham got away from me last time, but never again. Look what I have. And he's going to dangle the lookalike of Avraham through all the streets of Mesopotamia and tell the world he didn't get away from me. God, that's I, I rule. And when Avraham heard, his entire career is on the line. Because Avraham Avinu went around the world preaching monotheism, preaching in the power of, of Hashem. If word is going to get out, if it's going to go on to the front cover of the Mesopotamian times, that Nimrod gets revenge against Abraham, and God demonstrates his true power, then Avraham's entire career is down the drain. So Nimrod captures Lot, he doesn't care about Lot. He, this is a way of getting back at Avraham. And that is why Avraham had to risk his life to save Lot to maintain the ideals of Hashem Echad. There's a, a humorous anecdote. Do I have four? How, what do I have? There's a humorous anecdote. I don't think it ever happened. It's, it's not a medrash, but it's brought down in Svarim where they play out what may have happened. They play out a story where one day Nimrod goes to Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu was the greatest host in history, you know, like Josh. And, and a- Avraham uh, serves Nimrod, and Avraham gives him the best uh, food and the best accommodations. And uh, Avraham says, okay, Nimrod, time to pay up. And Nimrod said, well, what's going on? I thought you're Abraham. You, you're the, the quintessential host. You don't charge your guests. And Abraham says, no, that, those are regular guests of flesh and blood. But you're God, and I do charge God. So uh, Nimrod says, why do you charge God? And Abraham says, because every time I have a meal, and I want to charge my guests, uh, and, and my guests offer to pay, I said, no, it's okay, it's, it's a free service. And they say, you know what? May God pay you back for your kindness. So, now's my chance. No, it's pay up. How much do you want? I want $300,000. So, so uh, Nimrod says, ridiculous. The, the meal costs... No, no, you don't understand. I have a ledger of all the people that ate by me, and they kept on promising me, may God pay you double for all your efforts. So I actually have a ledger of an accounting of all my guests, and now that God is here, pay me double. So... So Nimrod says, uh, sorry, I left my American Express at home. What, 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 what credit cards do I use here? That's fine. That's fine, American Express. So uh, Avram says, what God leaves American Express at, at home? The Pasuk says, Li ha-kesef, li hazav no Hashem. Give me your money. Or write me a document that you admit that you're not a God. So Nimrod says, no, but I just have it at home. Oh, it's God's carry their money with them. So Nimrod had no choice. Avram said, if you don't pay up now, give me your horse, give me your mantle, and give me all of your royal possessions. So Nimrod was forced to write a document. I admit I am not God. And Avram's walking around the streets waving this his whole life, saying, look, there's a God of heaven and earth. Nimrod is a fake, a phony. He admitted it to me. So this is Nimrod's opportunity to capture Avraham and tell the world that it's, no, I am the God. 
But here's the problem. The Mepharshim bring down a very interesting um, behind the scenes that took place. And that is, Lavush tells us, probably after Avraham was thrown into the fire and he emerged unscathed, so Nimrod was very smart. Nimrod realized, you know, Avraham could get back at me. Avram's a powerful guy. He's connected to God. I'm going to go like Avimelech and sign a peace treaty with Avraham that I will never harm you and you will never harm me. After all, we find all the kings did that with Avraham Yitzhak. So probably Nimrod did that as well. And that would sort of tie Avraham's hands from ever taking revenge against Nimrod. But now Nimrod took a misstep. You know what the misstep was? He captured Lot. He captured Lot. He broke the treaty. You break the treaty, Avraham could get back at him. And that's exactly what happened over here. And just pay careful attention. Fayihi bimei Amraphel. It was in the days of Amraphel. But what are you talking about? He's not the main character. The main character is Kedar Oimer. The answer is, of course, if you were living during the times and you're reporting the news of the times, of course you would report it. It's Kedar Oimer, Sidal, Amraphel, and Aryeich. But that's if you don't understand the story from the Torah perspective. But you want to know why the Torah is recording the story? You want to know why it's in the Bible? It's in the Bible because Bimei Amraphel. It was in the days of Amraphel. Who's Amraphel? Nimrod. Why are we calling him Amraphel? We're cluing you in into why we need to tell you the story. We need to tell you the story because remember at the end of Parshas Noyach, Nimrod threw Avram into the fire? Well, this week's Parsha is what we call Sweet Revenge. God does not allow the tzaddik to be abused forever. Revenge comes very quickly. By he be me Amraphel, it wasn't the days of Amraphel, but Amraphel was subsidiary. The answer is that that's true from a political perspective. Kedal Amr was the main guy. But from the perception of Hashem and why the story is in the Torah, it's all about Nimrod. And you know what Nimrod captures? Take a look at number nine. By Yikhu es light, they took light. And you know what Light's great possession was? You know what his great treasure was? The Esrechushai ben Achi Avram. His great treasure was he's the nephew of Avram. And that's why they captured him because he looks exactly like Avram. When Avram heard that his brother was captured, meaning that his lookalike was captured, Avram has to make the move fast in order to preserve Kiddushim Shemayim, to preserve his teachings. And basically what happens is, once Nimrod broke the treaty and captured Lot, Avraham is able to take revenge. And there's a Pasuk in Tehillim. Yismach Tzadik ki chaza nakam. The Tzadik will rejoice when he sees revenge. And the truth is, in Navi it writes, that in the end of days, one of the great rewards of the world to come is the revenge that we will enjoy that only God could take against our enemies. But from this episode we learn that there is retribution and sometimes even in this world and that is why this story of the four kings and the five kings appears in the Chumash but really the lesson I want to bring out is when we, when we, le- when we learn Chumash apologize when we learn Chumash we have to be perceptive to every detail, every letter, every name, every word, the order. Because sometimes if you miss a clue, then you miss the clue that reveals and opens up the story to us. So let this serve as a model of how we should approach Torah in general, how every detail is a treasure. And uh, thank Hashem that He gave us some access to uh, His Holy Torah. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Bracha v'hatzlach. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.